Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Mary Sue Barrett. I'm president of the Metropolitan Planning Council, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you here for a Transform Illinois celebration and kind of rallying the troops. Uh, it's a little bit of both. You are here because um, probably you're curious. Hopefully you'll have a chance to learn to meet some new folks who might be your future allies and also to celebrate success. Um, I am the president of an organization that is a part of Transform Illinois, which is a collaboration that has come together uh, because of the enormous challenges we face um, as a metropolitan region. What I'd like to do is first introduce a couple of my MPC colleagues who, if you don't know, I hope you have a chance to meet here um, today. Uh, we have, uh, first of all, our senior fellow, Hill Hammock, uh, right over here. Hill is a board member, and we all uh, should be so fortunate to have board members who step up this and say, I would like to help you dig deep into something and spend some time on it. And, and it was the government efficiency work that drew him in. So he's been a, gu a guide, a coach, an advisor every step of the way to a team of us at MPC. Um, I'm just going to name real quick and, and recognize uh, in the back Alden Lowry, our research director, Mandy Burrell Booth, our communications director up front. Josh Ellis, there he is, um, who is uh, our team leader on this. Uh, Madeline Shepard, uh, who is also uh, a part of the team. And any of us here at MPC would be happy to talk to you afterwards about ways to get involved. But we're fortunate that we're joined by many, many other of our partners. Um, so we're just happy to be the ones uh, providing our conference center space. But the experts and the energy comes from the collaboration. It also comes from our partnerships across government and the private sector. Today's event is uh, sponsored by a really important company that's been with us every step of the way, White & Company, partnering with government, civic institutions. We're delighted that um, Steve and Pat, you are both here today. Um, you're terrific allies. White & Company is uh, a problem solver just like MPC and Transform Illinois try to be. So thank you for being our supporter and making these educational events uh, possible. So our commitment to local government efficiency is really intertwined with everything uh, that MPC works on. I don't need to tell many of you the statistics. Um, our 7,000 units of government fall into about 50 categories. And that means that we are highly fragmented. That means we are highly inefficient. Um, that is crazy making, uh, just to, as far as getting things done. And we've got an expert here today to help us understand how we fit in the world, but also the price that we pay. Um, voter apathy is one that doesn't get as much uh, attention as some of the fiscal impacts, but they are both really, really important. We just have to look at our last um, municipal elections to see that we hit, uh, we hit a new low as far as voter participation, and, and that's um, not something we want to uh, continue that trend. So we are really committed to interrupting that trend, um, to being a problem solver, and to being a convener. So I was delighted when um, our colleague, Dan Cronin, who you'll meet in a moment, chairman of the DuPage County Board, stepped up and said that he was willing um, to provide energy and momentum to these issues, and that he was willing to set the table, and he wanted us to join him in that effort. So um, with Dan, uh, providing the vision and the energy, it was easy for me to say yes, um, that I would be delighted to lend some of our time um, and attention and resources. Uh, but I think the other thing that made it easy for both Dan and I to uh, stick with this is our partners. There are representatives here from every single one of these organizations, uh, the League of Women Voters, Taxpayers Federation of Illinois, Northern Illinois University Center for Governmental Studies, the Illinois Chamber of Commerce, the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus, Illinois Campaign for Political Reform, CMAP, the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, and finally, the Better Government Association. All of these institutions, um, and those are the folks who are at, you know, kind of at the, at the table, lending staff expertise, are joined by many other key partners who are also committed. And that's how we're going to get things done, by continuing to build uh, the momentum, the tent, and being really specific about uh, actions that we can take. So we know we, highlighting the problem can often leave you almost feeling overwhelmed and frustrated. So what Transform Illinois has come together around is a three-part agenda. We've been advocating in Springfield, uh, and 22 bills introduced last year was a huge signal of interest that 
that was pent up, um, and five of those were passed, which is uh, terrific. You'll hear a little bit about that. Coordinated research, trying to understand what's the data points that are missing, what are the uh, gaps of knowledge for us to be able to understand and then, and then act, how can we fill those gaps. And then finally, things like this fit into our public education agenda. You may also be interested in our taking action agenda on the website, both Transform Illinois' website and Metropolitan Planning Council's website. It's a great resource for all of us who are working at the local government um, or community level about who's doing what that's cutting edge and how can we uh, imitate and improve on that. So that's what part of our agenda is about, and you will give us ideas today about what we need to work on on that agenda going forward. So I would like to turn it over to my um, partner in this effort, Dan Cronin. He is an inspiration to us. He stepped forward and said uh, not only was he going to take some risks in DuPage County, but he was going to offer that helping hand to other uh, units of government. And you have indeed inspired us. Thank you, Chairman Cronin. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Sue. You're very kind. And uh, I've enjoyed working with you and the Metropolitan Planning Council. Um, I remember working with Mary Sue when she was the policy director for Mayor Daley back in uh, a few years ago when I worked in Springfield. Uh, just a few years ago. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us to learn more about Transform Illinois and to salute some deserving transformers that we have here in our state. As you know, uh, I'm from DuPage County, so I'd like to give a shout out to our DuPage officials who've joined us here. I saw Paul Fickner uh, joined us. He's a board member, chairman of our finance committee. Um, I think Gary Grasso was supposed to join us. I don't know if he's here. I know that Hanover Park Mayor Rodney Craig is here. Um, we have uh, sitting next to Rodney is the village uh, manager from Woodridge. Katie Rush is here. Uh, we have Bensonville Mayor, Mayor Frank Soto has joined us, um, I think. Uh, Woodridge Trustee Greg Abbott, an old friend, and I know somebody who's been very interested in this issue. Um, and I should say that uh, Warrenville City Administrator John Coakley's here, Assistant City Administrator Christina White, John Carpenter from Choose DuPage, our economic development arm of the county, and our DuPage team of Cheryl, Joan, and Chad. It's just been, uh, we've been a great, uh, it's been a great experience working with all of us. Thanks for attending, all of you. The idea of changing the culture of government is what brings us together here today. Uh, two years ago this month, uh, we invited a group of friends, many of whom are here, uh, to sit around a table and envision what we could do to make local government work better for our residents and our taxpayers. We knew that there were too many units of local government in Illinois. We knew that we needed legislative muscle uh, to create some change. We knew we needed research and partners around the state to take up our cause and act as allies uh, when there were votes to be taken. Uh, either in the legislature or via a community referendum. And so uh, we reached out uh, to Mary Sue and the Metropolitan Planning Council, the Better Government Association, lawmakers, friends from my days in the Illinois Senate, Susan Garrett from the Illinois Campaign for Political Reform is here. Um, reached out to her, the Taxpayers Federation, CMAP, State Chamber. We looked at that slide moments ago. Um, we all came together, and thanks to the operational commitment of Metropolitan Planning Council, we divvied up the assignments and we got to work. So let's, let's review our checklist, if, we, if I may, please. We wanted to create partnerships and build a bench of supporters who understood the need for efficient, effective government brought forth by reducing costs, increasing accountability, and streamlining, right? The, resu the results of those efforts are at least partially on display today. Uh, we embrace the effective work of Senator Tom Cullerton and Representative Tom Demmer, uh, who are here with us today. We acknowledge the change in culture and practice that brings the Village of Algonquin its Transformer Award. And not for the first time, we praise the dedication of the board of the Century Hill uh, Street Lighting District uh, which I believe is an inspiring story of public service and devotion. I think Tom Cieslack is here with us today. So whether you've come here today as an office holder, government staff member, or a student, uh, I ask that you listen and take away the framework of change uh, that we propose. When you return to your workplace uh, or out in your own community, uh, filter what you hear, th hear here through this framework and ask yourselves, 
Could we do it better? Uh, could we do it cheaper? Could we do it more efficiently? Could we do it uh, in a way that uh, hasn't really been considered before by maybe sharing services, cooperating with others, our next door neighbor? Can we make this process work better for our customers, our taxpayers? Just asking those questions and having the will to make the change can be the first and most important step uh, in making Illinois work better for its residents. Uh, no one knows better than I do that changing the same old, same old is, uh, is difficult. The ship of government turns slowly. Uh, Susan's laughing there, I see that. Um, we've, been, we've had some frustrations, but we've also celebrated some, some victories. There are entrenched interests with a lot at stake uh, and some of those outdated legacy systems. And Lord knows I've had conversations with those folks. They're very animated, red faces, veins popping out of their neck. And, uh, but as you can probably tell, I have no shortage of inspiration on this topic. One really great and influential speaker I saw recently is here this afternoon as our guest. Chris Berry joins us from the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy, where he is a professor and academic director of the Center for Municipal Finance. His book, Imperfect Union, Representation and Taxation in Multi-Level Governments, was winner of the Best Book Award in Urban Politics from the American Political uh, Science Association, American Political Science Association. But most importantly, it got him noticed by uh, HBO's John Oliver and landed him in a notable television segment on Oliver's comedy program focused on the proliferation of local government which, by the way, was a segment both education and um, I think it was quite hilarious, too. <laughs> so without further ado, and no pressure, of course, Professor, uh, please help me welcome Dr. Chris Berry. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for that kind introduction. I want to say it's really an honor to have been invited here today to speak to this group. Uh, I feel like there is no, no shortage of of news on the failings of our politics and government these days and what's wrong and what's broken. And so I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to share the room and the stage with some people who are part of the solution. And, and it's an honor to be here. Where's the clicker? Ah, thank you. OK, so uh, a lot of what I'll talk about uh, draws heavily on my book, Imperfect Union, which, which uh, as we just referenced, was, was a subject of a, of a recent uh, John Oliver episode. And I have to say, when they first called me to, with the idea of, of doing this episode, my immediate reaction was, uh, I thought you guys were a comedy show. <laughs> and, and, and they said, well, you let us worry about the funny. And, and I would say they succeeded in that, in fact, so much so that you all would find a better way to spend the next 20 minutes if you tuned me out and got out your phones and <laughs> went on YouTube and watched the, that episode. Uh, thankfully, I think most of you are too polite to do that. If I said that to my students, they'd already be on their phones already by now. Uh, but since you're stuck with me, let me, uh, let me give you the, the probably non-funny version of, of what I've got to say. Uh, what I'm going to talk about generally is, is a topic that I'm going to refer to as fiscal tragedies of the commons. So many of you probably heard the expression tragedy of the commons. It's when some shared resource is overused by the people uh, who share it. And I want to talk about our tax base as a uh, common pool resource that is uh, currently uh, close to tragedy uh, in its overuse. And in order to understand this problem, I'm going to suggest that we understand its history and we're going to actually go back uh, farther than you might have expected in this talk in, in our history. And then we're going to go back to, to the Silk Road. I talk about the Silk Road uh, around 600, the year 600. And as you probably know, the Silk Road is uh, about a 5,000 mile long road that connected the civilizations of China and the Mediterranean. And along the road were many sort of independent uh, principalities, kingdoms, and such. Eventually, as trade began to develop on the Silk Road, you know, a lot of traders and merchants found this as a good way to get their goods from the water to various inland uh, communities. Many of these communities saw the traders coming through and thought to themselves, hey, you know, this is a great source of revenue for us. And so you started to merge on the, on the Silk Road a series of, of taxes. So, you know, first one jurisdiction would say, you know, if you want to pass through our community on the way to where you're going, you're going to need to pay us a little bit of a tax. Eventually, a lot of them got this idea, and taxes proliferated along the Silk Road. And from the merchant's perspective, what was important was the total tax, or the total cost of moving from one end of the road to the other. That's what you have to ask yourself when you're trying to figure out, should I send my goods uh, over this route as opposed to some alternative, such as perhaps going, take, going around, though slower, but going around, out, around, around the sea. And what happened is the amount of taxes began to be so high, again, because each individual 
the kingdom along the way cared only about the revenue it would get from its tax, and it wasn't thinking about what impact is that going to have on the total cost of using the road, which is in fact what the taxpayer cared about, the merchant. And eventually trade dried up on the, on, on the Silk Road, and it wasn't until this whole area was unified under, <clears throat> under the Mongol Empire that taxes were brought into line. So finally you had sort of one decision maker deciding what the cost should be going across this road as opposed to many. Okay, taxes went down, trade flourished, and wealth grew. Okay. So first lesson from history is, you know, the taxpayer or the merchant in this example cares about the total cost, okay? They don't really care how much comes from each individual source, whereas each individual principality cares about what can they get out of these, these traders, and so this uncoordinated taxation uh, has killed uh, the goose that laid the golden egg. So let us fast forward in history, not too far, but let's go up to the year 1250, and to a totally different place in the world. And some of you may recognize this as the Rhine River. And the Rhine River today is a major commercial thoroughfare. It's about 300 million tons of freight go down it every year, and it connects, it connects Switzerland to the Dutch ports on, on the North Sea, and lots of uh, goods go down this river. It's also a major tourist destination, and many of you may have visited it, and if you did, you, it was probably because of, of the beautiful castles that are located all along, uh, all along the Rhine. And what you may not know, even if you have visited the Rhine, is that you know, most of these are toll castles. Okay? Toll castles mean they were built to collect tolls from people putting their goods down the river. Now, we have toll booths today. That's nothing. Okay? <laughs> these guys are toll castles, and they still stand. Okay? Let's hope our toll booths are not still standing in another uh, 800 years. But these do. And so what happened is through much of the, the Middle Ages, the, the whole area was controlled through, by the Holy Roman Empire, which kind of set a tax rate that took into account you know, the cost that, of, to, the, to the merchant and tried to generate the total revenue that was uh, for, for, the, for the empire that would maximize um, its welfare. There was a brief period, though, during the interregnum around 1250 where basically the central authority broke down. There was no coordinating body. And what happened is we had about, about uh, 60 toll roads, toll, toll castles, I should say, about 60 toll castles. Uh, appear during this time, it's estimated that at its height, or maybe it's, it's nadir, however you want to think about it, that the tolls represented about 60% of the value of goods that went down. So in other words, you were, you know, if you're a merchant and you wanted to send your goods on this river, you would spend about 60% of the value of the goods from the one end to the other. Okay? Unsurprisingly, as a result of that, commerce completely dried up on the Rhine, okay? and it was no longer used uh, as a commercial thoroughfare. It wasn't until uh, some time later that the so-called Rhine League developed, which was, an, which was an agreement of the principalities that shared the Rhine to lower their taxes. And again, a similar lesson uh, from history from what we saw on the Silk Road, which is the taxpayer, the merchant, the source of the revenue cares about the total cost. Each individual prince along the road only cares about their share. So when you have one of these toll castles, what you're thinking about, hey, if I raise my toll a little bit, I'll get a little bit more revenue from the people who pass through it. And you're not thinking about the fact that eventually that's going to deter the people from using the river at all, okay? because you're just one small share of that total tax. They're going to pass through 60 toll castles on their way down. And you're saying, well, my one little toll castle, if I add to it, is not going to really cause a problem. Of course, everybody else in the other 59 toll castles is feeling the same way. And at the end of the day, what you have is no commerce left. All right. So two lessons from history. And I'm going to say is surely we've learned these lessons by now. Uh, let's fast forward, however, let's fast forward, however, to today and to what is arguably, I would say, the most modern of modern contrivances, the cell phone. And let's ask, you, how do we tax that? So here's an example just from New York of how we tax cell phone usage, ownership. This is just an, you know, a list of all the taxes that are, and I don't have to tell you this because you all presumably have a cell phone, and, uh, and you're all paying some tax that looks something like this. But in total, it's about 23% of the value of the, uh, of the money that's spent on, on, on the phone um, is going into, into taxes. All right. Now, what I want to talk so it was just to say, these problems are ubiquitous. They've been with us for a long time. They apply in lots of areas. What I want to talk about today uh, especially has to do with the, the issue of property taxes, which is where this is going to be most relevant for, for local government. And so here's just an example of a, of a hypothetical um, uh, local, local, uh, local area where it's, you know, we've got a, a city, several different school districts, several different fire districts, recreation districts, sanitation districts, okay? So although this does not have the same sort of geographic nature of the, of the Rhine and the, and, and the Silk Road, the same thing is happening. What we've got is these basically overlapping bundles of jurisdictions, 
Okay, and this is a, an example of this. Any given property is going to fall onto, in this simple example here, four. I wish it were really that simple in practice. But in this simple example, four jurisdictions that are levying taxes on it. And it's exactly the same kind of a problem, where now we've got these vertically stacked jurisdictions. They all can draw revenue out of this shared pool. Okay? And the taxpayer really cares about their total property tax bill and not so much what comes from each little uh, source. And yet, nobody has the incentive to internalize this total cost. And when I said this is a, a simplified version, uh, let me show you something like the real version. This is, and this was not easy to get, I have to tell you, this is an actual map of Illinois of all the taxing jurisdictions that exist in our, in our state. And uh, there are about 8,000 of them. I would say nobody, they don't seem to really have an official source or any kind of formal agreement on this, but there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 8,000 of these jurisdictions, and they overlap each other in 38,000 unique patterns. Okay, which is to say there's 38,000 distinct combinations of local governments that exist in the state of Illinois today. Wow. Now, why is this important? Because this is going to take us back to the Silk Road and back to the Rhine River. What are these guys doing? Well, they're levying a whole bunch of overlapping taxes. And so this is just a, you know, a tax bill I downloaded from here in Cook County. What you can see is here's the list of all the taxes that are being applied to, to a particular property. You'll know if you kind of study these kinds of things, it's also a little bit complicated to even figure out which jurisdictions are levying those taxes because some of these are lists of the names of jurisdictions that have a tax. Others are the names of particular funds that are absorbing some of the tax. And so if you're a taxpayer, not even going to be obvious from this from the, from this bill uh, where your money is going, but it's clearly going to a lot of different places and a lot of different units that are imposing taxes on you. And the common theme then that I want to, th that, that takes us from the Silk Road and to, to Cook County today and the rest of Illinois today, frankly, is this notion of the tragedy of the commons, uh, which is sometimes referred to as the overfishing problem. And so as this comes to us from environmental economics, where the usual you know, problem goes like the following. You know, we have a stock of fish that live in the ocean. We have open access to the use of those fish. We have many fisher people who are able to go and uh, dip their lines in there and pull some fish out. But the problem is we all know that if we pull too many fish out today, we're going to deplete the stock, and there's not going to be fish left for us tomorrow. Okay, so we should like to leave some in there, to at least a sufficient number that the stock can, can be sustained. And yet, at the moment, there's so many different fisher people pulling things out that any one person's incentive today is to say, I should take a couple extra fish for me today because I can sell them today and get that revenue. And the fish that I leave in for tomorrow is going to be absorbed by the pool as a whole and shared by everybody else. My share of that's not so much. Okay? When everyone is thinking that way and everyone is behaving that way, we get what's called you know, a tragedy of the, of the commons. And I think the same ideas apply to our shared tax bases. Okay? And we have a lot already begun to think in, in we, you know, the words of sustainability, environmental sustainability. We use these, these phrases a lot. We have tried to develop solutions to the overfishing problem through all kinds of, of uh, mechanisms. And I want to suggest that we should think about also our tax base as a shared resource that is precious and not inexhaustible. Okay? And if we want to sustain it and preserve it over time, we have to think about it in kind of the same ways that we would think about the overfishing problem here. Okay? Unfortunately, that's not, uh, that's not the way we, we, t we tend to think about it for the, for the most part. So let me give you a little more context. So first of all, this is not a particular Illinois or Cook County problem, though I hope to, I think you probably know, and I'll show you some evidence that we have it, we have it bad. <laughs> we have it bad. Uh, but, but here's just a, a map that the Census Bureau produced of the, of the many layers of government uh, throughout the country. And I won't, we won't want to try to like, read at a micro level all, all of the, the result. But basically, you know, the darker blue colors are, are the areas that have more and more layers of government overlapping each other. Uh, Illinois, of course, is pretty dark. Uh, pretty, pretty dark, and, uh, and you can see that some other parts of the other region are not. But anyway, so this is a widespread problem. We happen to be at, at a very end of the distribution uh, in terms of the, its severity. Compounding this and making it somewhat different from some of the others I've talked about is the way in which we hold our elections. Okay? And this is an example from, uh, from Nassau County in New York where one of, the, one of the county commissioners got really interested in this question, why are we spending so much money on election administration? And so uh, ordered a survey of just when the elections are happening and how much they're spending on it. And what this is, this is only for six months out of the year. I'm not going to show you the other six months, but they look pretty similar. This is for six months out of the year, and each colored day here is the day in which an election is taking place, okay, in Nassau County. And you can see it's color-coded what kind of election, but we've got all the special districts. We've got... Um, 
of course, municipalities, townships, villages, and all that kind of thing. So on each day, and then imagine that the rest of the year looks just the same, uh, we, have an, we have an election. And turnout in these elections is notoriously low. Uh, and some statistics are, are written here, but I think we know this too from, from looking, around, uh, looking around where we, li we live. And we have to ask, in, in, the, in the setting where turnout is so low and the elections are held at such odd times, who participates in them? Okay? And the answer is going to be the people who care most about that thing. Okay? That's not bad in many ways, but it can have bad fiscal consequences when you have people who have more demand for this thing who are the ones most likely to vote and people with less demand uh, are, are less likely to vote. And certainly that we don't have anything like a median voter in the population as a whole turning out in these kind of elections. Okay? So we're going to compound just the, uh, the underlying fiscal incentives of a shared tax base with having governments that are elected by a relatively small share of the population that cares a lot about the narrow thing that that government does and, and wants more of it than, than, say, the median voter would like. Okay. This is part two of the, of, the, of the problem. This, I'm not going to bore you with this. This is the part that, that uh, you know, I like talking about most, but this is from some of, the, some of the statistical work I've done to try to estimate what, in fact, are the, are the effects of this tax overlap on the overall size of government. And essentially, this is, we'll be, think of this as the number of overlapping governments, and this is the, the change in the taxes. And to, to, to save you uh, all, the, all the boring but most important part of the, of, the, of the book statistics is that basically if we move from sort of uh, the 25th to 75th percentile in the amount of overlap, we're going to increase our taxes by about 10 percent, and which is to say for every three uh, new jurisdictions we add, we're going to drive up taxes by about, by about 10 percent. All right. So this is a general discussion at the level of, uh, of the, the, the theory and then the, the, uh, the specific underlying mechanisms that generate this in terms of selective participation. Let's talk about our region, and I think Mary Sue already alluded to just the sheer number of jurisdictions we have. So here's one, and I should say this is from a report uh, written by the OECD that came and did sort of a profile of, of the Chicago regional economy not too long ago, and they did this count. And you have to, I mean, and the OECD is going around the world and doing, you know, major metropolitan regions and doing similar kind of profiles. And, you know, there's nothing like this to be seen uh, if you want to compare this to London or something like this. This is not, you know, but so what we have, and you know, and again, probably don't have to tell this crowd uh, these statistics, but we've got 572 general purpose jurisdictions, nearly 800 special purpose, 367 different school districts, okay? So we've got a lot, uh, and we're at one end of, of the spectrum on this, probably the most extreme in the country. We have this electoral overload problem where these are just the offices that are going to be on the ballot this November. Okay, and this is not even talking about all the other elections that take place, the municipal elections, all, you know, the, the general and the primary. This is just one, this is just what's going to happen in uh, Tuesday in November. Okay. And I think we have this idea, often when we create these special purpose governments, we, which have this independent tax authority, we have this idea that more democracy is better. Right? Oh, we're going to create a new lever for voters. There's a new way that they can control government because now they've got this one specialized unit that does this one thing, and they'll be independently elected, and so now we've given them more degrees of freedom to control the government. The problem, as I, as I suggest, is we can act, there can be too much of a good thing, and we can, in fact, have too much democracy when we reach a point at which even a very informed, very studious person cannot keep track of just the, the identity of the elected officials who, who represent them, much less the quality of the job they're doing. Okay? And it's, you know, by my count, the average person in Cook County is represented by 70 different elected officials. And you cannot expect, this is probably the most informed group of people we'll, uh, we'll find in the region on this topic, and my guess is you can't, any of you name me those 70, uh, much, le much less offer an opinion as to the job that they're doing. Okay. So here we see just, again, the, the, what, what this breaks down, taking that tax bill into where the, where the money actually goes. And again, it's a little bit confusing. This is a standard way of reporting these things. But some are actual jurisdictions. Some are funds that money goes into. But you can see that the, a lot of this pie is being shared around a lot of places. Now, I've emphasized the spending portion of this, the overspending and the overtaxation. But I think there's a couple other features that are worth emphasizing at this particular historical moment, which has to do with the amount of overlapping taxation and uh, uh, overlapping debt. Okay, so what this graph is showing you is the amount of overlapping debt. Okay, so the red bar is the, this is for Chicago. Okay, the red bar is the amount of debt per capita by the city of Chicago, and the yellow is the total amount of debt that's being taken on by all the overlapping jurisdictions that share that same tax base. Okay, and so from the 
again, from the voter's perspective, from the taxpayer's perspective, this, is, this total bar is kind of what you're on the hook for. It doesn't really matter from which it comes, and just like with the merchants on the Silk Road. And perhaps even more pressingly at the moment is this question of the overlapping of pension obligations. And so this is from a, a slide from a friend uh, 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 at, at Nuveen uh, who, who's done this study. So first of all, the fact that Nuveen is doing these studies, Nuveen who's an investor in, in municipal bonds, the fact that Nuveen is doing these studies tells you they are aware and concerned about that. That already should tell us we should be concerned about it. And this is their estimate of the total, what they call the cylinder of pension obligations, which is to say, take some particular property and look at the total amount of pension obligations that are stacked upon that by, from all the different jurisdictions. Okay, that are, that are basically drawing taxes from it. And you can see, and here these are, in, the dollars are staggering, I, uh, but you can, you can see what they are. And so we're looking at something, if we were to sum this all up, of about $21,000 per capita. That would be in addition to the cylinder of debt that I showed you on the previous slide. Okay, and then they're gonna say, here's what we would, well, how much would we need to increase taxes in order to pay that off? There's a lot of assumptions required in that. I'm not gonna hang my head on any particular number, but you can see, it. Well, it's a pretty big, it's a pretty big number. Okay. So let me just summarize what I said. Our tax base is a fiscal common pool, which is to say shared resource that many people are drawing, uh, drawing revenue out of. Okay. But we don't have anyone who's responsible for that total bottom line bill, and that's what the taxpayer cares about. Okay. And just like other kinds of shared resources, it is subject to overuse. And the important point we have to remember is it is not inexhaustible, and there are reactions to the taxes, okay? Taxes drive away economic activity, just as if the Rhine, the Rhine tolls drove business off the Rhine River and the Silk Road dried up. So too can our economy if we're not careful about the extent to which we are doing the very same thing. All right, so what should we do about it? Uh, this is gonna be like my very brief ending because I feel like you guys probably should answer that question. Um, but uh, you're, you're transformers. Um, so, so here's just gonna be some thoughts. Uh, so I'm just gonna talk about principles of reform as opposed to a specific, you know, we should pass the following bill or something like that. There were some principles that come out of, you know, my study and you know, my way of thinking about this. Look at the following. So I think, first of all, what's important, so accountability, competition, transparency, trans, transparency and consolidation. But each one of these, I have something specific in mind. So competition. I think it's really important that we, we don't respond to these kind of findings by saying, yes, what we need is some kind of massive regional government. Okay? That is the last thing we need. It's really important to bear, and I know this may be a controversial place to say that. But... Uh, but it's really important to maintain the advantages of competition amongst local jurisdictions. It's important that people can move school districts, they can move cities. Okay, having these options is, is important, and what we wouldn't want to do is say, oh, look at this, there's too many governments, we should just have one Chicago area region-wide government. No, what we want to have is an elimination of the vertical dimension of the proliferation, but maintain all the horizontal dimensions, which is to say, we'd like to have a lot of different municipalities that exist competing with each other for residents, but they should have a monopoly power over the things they control. They shouldn't be sharing their tax base with lots of other jurisdictions that can come in and raise taxes out of their, out of their shared tax base. All right, so maintain competition. Consolidation, I think, is, you know, the, uh, Dan Cronin and others have been at the forefront of trying to lead this, and I would say, you know, like my observations, it's incredibly difficult if what we mean by consolidation is the elimination of jurisdictions in, into some other one. I think there is a step short of that that still may be effective, which is that it is much more important to consolidate tax authority than it is to consolidate the jurisdictions per se. So it has been very difficult, for instance, to get any momentum behind getting rid of townships, where there's a lot of people who, who love the township. Um, and there's always going to be some special interest constituency that, is, that wants to keep the, the township. Uh, it would be a major step forward to remove the township's independent tax authority and make it dependent on some other government who is responsible. Okay, and so, for instance, you might imagine some government that's responsible for the total tax bill that, and, and doles it out to all the, all the local governments. Okay? Transparency, as I said, I think truth in taxation is important. I gave you an example, or I showed you a Cook County tax bill, and we can't figure out where the taxes are coming from. Even though it's helpfully itemized, it's not obvious which is an independent fund, which is a government, and I think it is very difficult for a voter, even a very informed one, to just ask a simple question of like, which governments do I pay taxes to, and how much exactly do I pay to them? I think we, you know, a simple reform would be to start or, uh, changing the way we report our tax bills, uh, and there's lots of other ways in which we could publicize this information, because again, just like with the merchants on the Silk Road, what you want to know when you're at the beginning of the Silk Road is what's it going to cost me by the time I get to the end of it, and we need to have a much clearer answer to that. 
All this together, I think, is going to bring us toward uh, accountability. And we're really, what I'm, when, I, when I talk about accountability, I'm talking about changing the incentives of the elected officials that are, that are, uh, that are involved, where you know, we, we actually have an incentive now to lower taxes as opposed to raising them or to, to take account of the total tax burden that people face as opposed to just one small piece of it. Uh, whereas right now, we've got a set of political incentives that make each jurisdiction very sensitive to its small piece Okay, that goes, that goes to, oh, I want to, I want to be clear, that goes to some good and useful purpose for whom there are beneficiaries who really want it, but nobody that's saying, well, what in total, what is the, what is the burden on, on folks? Um, so those are, those are my thoughts, and I think I'm exactly out of time. So I will, t I will take your questions. Uh, my name is Judy Stevens. I'm policy manager of the Better Government Association BGA's in its uh, 93rd year working on transparency, accountability, uh, uh, ethics, and efficiency in government. Um, so we have a little bit of time on our agenda for uh, questions for the professor. An amazing presentation. Uh, so, um, yeah. Wait for the microphone. Oh, yeah, that's the drill. Finish with a question. Five minutes. Okay. Thank you, Josh. You are welcome, sir. Um, I was sort of curious, last week Carl Dean was here, former mayor of Nashville, Tennessee, and he talked about one of the best things they did was consolidate the city and the county government, and you seem to say the opposite. So I'm sort of wondering the difference. I mean, is it because of Cook County and Chicago, or is it how large they are, how much money they're in debt? Why do you say that it's really not a good idea for this consolidation? Thanks for the question. So I that's a question. Yeah, it was a very good question. Got it. That, that's a very precise question. So I think that you know, the important thing is to recognize the trade-offs between what are you going to get through consolidation? Okay, you will get some efficiencies or economies of scale within the the new jurisdiction that's larger and, and internalized. So there will be less duplication from having two of a bunch of stuff. Uh, the, the, on the flip side of that, what you're going to lose is the, ins the incentives that come from competition, the fact that people can move across jurisdictions. And so uh, my question would be, if we're, are we mean, what are, what's left after this consolidation? Are, you know, there are, are several, many different school districts still left? To what extent do people still have a choice of where to live? And the consolidation, uh, if it's just the city and the county within the city's border, that's, that's what I'm in favor of, because I, like, I want is vertical uh, consolidation, not horizontal consolidation. Does it, is the dis distinction between vertical and horizontal clear? So vertical is I want uh, all the taxing units that overlay a property to be consolidated in one that's responsible to the, for the following for, for the bill. What I think is bad is to consolidate the many competing jurisdictions that might exist around the region that are trying to attract people by having more attractive goods and services. And I don't know enough about that particular consolidation to say if it came closer to the one than the other. But I can tell you I would think about it by asking how how do the trade-offs work on these on these two factors and. My read, I mean, there's not a lot of evidence on consolidation, I would say, overall. And my reading is that usually the savings are not what people had, had expected. But, but I, won't, I don't want to issue a judgment on Nashville. I would just say I would want to think about this other factor. And I'm yeah, curious whether he talked about that. I think we've got time for just a couple more questions. Yes. Oh, oh, oh sorry. No problem. I can speak loud. No, you need to wait for the mic. <laughs> So th this goes to the accountability issue. Ha have there been studies that show that there's a, a higher incidence of corruption when there's so many multiple forms of government versus those that are more consolidated? Uh, good, good question. I think if there were any such study, there would be one huge outlier that would determine its conclusion, and that would be the place where we are right now. And so, <laughs> I, I, in other words, any statistical analysis that tried to relate the amount of corruption and the number of jurisdictions will have one huge <laughs> data point that for sure will guarantee there's a positive relationship. Uh, that's, that's partly a joke. Uh, the, the, um, the answer is, yeah, I don't think we, we know. I, there are lots of profiles of, the, of small governments that, uh, that are subject to corruption. But I, you know, so there was a big profile of lots of special districts um, in New York and and, and all kinds of corruption there, but uh, I don't think, other than there seems to, there is a visible correlation, I, I'm not aware of a serious study that's, that's looked at that, partly because corruption itself is, is hard to measure, and if people are really good at it, then we shouldn't be able to measure it at all. Uh, okay, one more question back there. Okay, thank you. Um, and back to vertical, con <clears throat> excuse me, consolidation. And 
So leaving Cook County and the city of Chicago out of this, because that's a whole different ball of wax, but I live, for example, in a smaller municipality up in Lake County, and it has exactly that problem, and you've got special district after special district floating bond issues because they want a new library, they want a new elementary school, they want a new high school, and a new beach, and you wind up with voter- I, knew, I didn't know you could get a new beach. That's we great. got a new beach, <laughs> um, where they circumvented the bonding requirements, by the way. The whole thing was, was bad. but. Um, you know, there I think you really need vertical consolidation where you need to actually consolidate. I don't, because you, I think you need to be able to hold all these different elected officials accountable and force them to prioritize, and they can't do it if you don't actually vertically consolidate. And so is that an area where you think, you know, take the school district, the library board, you know, leave the county out, but the, you know, the, the city council and force one body to be not just responsible for the taxing, but responsible for the spending, and it's it, yeah, absolutely yeah. that's exactly the kind of consolidation that I had that I have in mind. And and w when I said that I thought it was politically challenging, it's just come. For, I've observed various efforts of of people to try to do so. So, but that's exactly when I say that vertical consolidation. That's exactly the consolidation I mean. I think in our ideal world, we'd have one unit, as you described, that's responsible for taxes and spending in the area. Uh, and therefore, voters know who to hold, hold accountable for it. There would be one governing body associated with that, with that one unit. And I would just add that we would like to have many of those, such inter vertically integrated single units, many of those in an area to give people lots of choice of where to move and provide a second source of accountability. So the way I think about it is there's two sources of accountability in local government. One is at the ballot box. Okay, and this sort of vertical consolidation will enhance the ballot box type of accountability because people will now know, here's the one entity that's responsible for what's going on. But there's a second source of accountability that we should still take advantage of and not forget about, which is the possibility of people moving and the tax base leaving. Okay, and I think that's important too. So I would like to have the sort of consolidation that you've described as vertical consolidation of those units, but take many, have many of those to, to compete with each other. And so that's exactly the kind of consolidation that I have in mind. Now, I think we all agree that's not going to happen anytime soon, uh, but that's, again, that's on you guys. I'm... <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, thank Fab. you so much. Fab, fabulous. <laughs> Uh, tax and fiscal policy advocacy organization. They conduct policy research, educate public officials and others on current issues, advocate for a responsible tax structure that encourages economic growth, and they support efficient delivery of government services. And before joining TFI, Carol was assistant general counsel at Sears Holding Corporation, specializing in state and local tax matters. She has extensive experience in government fiscal issues, having served as TFI's chair, as treasurer, and been on its board uh, for a dozen years. <clears throat> and her exposure to these issues came early. Her father was a delegate to the 1970 Illinois Constitutional Convention, and her grandfather was president of the Illinois Farm Bureau. So here to present the Transformer Awards is Carol Portman. Here we go. All right, I, I feel like this is the, you know, the moment you've all been waiting for. I, I was explaining to my husband this morning, I don't know whether I'm the former award winner, which I'm not, so I guess that means I'm not, uh, who says, may I have the envelope, please, or am I the, am I the person coming out with the pretty dress to hand over the statue? I, I, I can't decide which I am, but um, I, I'm very excited to be here, and, and Judy just very accurately described the organization. We've been around for 75 years, and this is exactly the kind of thing that we were meant to do, and so I, I'm very happy that TFI is, is part of Transform Illinois, and it's a... Uh, it's it's a great honor to be here and, and to be part of the uh, award ceremony. Uh, the, the first two award recipients, I, I know that you all, or I'm pretty sure that most of you can read, and so in the materials at, at your chair when you got here today, it's a nice description of, of each of the award winners, and, and so I'm not going to go over all of that. I think the important part is is to hear from each of them and let them tell you about what they're doing and, and why they're so, so proud of it, because we certainly are, and uh, to inspire those of you out there doing the same kind of work to, to, to keep going with, with what you're working on. So uh, our, our first award recipient in the category of State Transformer is uh, State Senator Tom Cullerton. Senator Cullerton is familiar with, uh, with local government, having been uh, the Villa Park Village President and a trustee. He has been in the Senate since he was elected in November of 2012, and he has been part of this, of this effort towards making sense of local government efficiencies uh, since the beginning. So, so congratulations, Senator Cullerton. Come on up. Here, say a few words. 
questions? I'm usually shy behind a microphone and I don't tend to talk a lot. All right, that may not be true. Um, first of all, I want to thank you uh, for the award. It, uh, it's something I've been, uh, you know, since I was a village trustee in Villa Park, trying to just deliver services a little bit easier in the village. Uh, and we started with a permit shop, and actually I started talking about consolidation with Chairman Cronin when he became chairman about a sanitary district that was just outside Villa Park, and he actually told me it would have to be a state function to allow that to happen. Uh, that is not why I ran for office, uh, but once I got down there, he brought up the idea to me again that, hey, we should probably look at doing this. Uh, and we ended up passing a bill back in 2013 uh, that sort of started the ball rolling on government consolidation. Uh, I was proud to carry that bill. It was one of my first bills in the Senate. Uh, I didn't realize that usually you're not supposed to go in front of the executive committee for years till you actually learn how to pass bills. Um, but I jumped in uh, and Chairman Cronin was by my side. He helped sort of whip some of the Republican votes. I worked with my Democrat colleagues and then we sent it over to the House. Uh, and we've had great success. In the past year, we've had 22 bills that dealt with some form of consolidation. Uh, and what we've done and the success that we've had in DuPage County uh, Lake and McHenry now have those opportunities. Uh, and my goal when going back down in, no, in January is to roll that out so every county has the opportunity to do uh, what DuPage County started and what we're doing there. So I thank all of you for your insight, for your willingness to work on this issue. Uh, I, I have to agree, we have too many units of government. Uh, and the goal is, is how to, how to consolidate them but also how to do it smartly so that our, the people we serve, the people I serve, the people Dan serves, the people all of our elected officials serve, don't lose a service that they need. Uh, that's, that's the tricky part about this, and I think we did it smart in DuPage County. I think we're continuing to do it smart. I'm looking forward to the results from Lake and McHenry County and allowing every county to do it uh, throughout this state. So thank you all very much. And uh, do I raise it above my head? Is that, I, I've never done the award thing before, but uh, so thank you all very much. Here, one more question. I want this guy. Oh, all right. Uh, one tell more. him I want one good one. He wants one more. Perfect. Right, thank you. Sit up there because you're not, I mean, on the, on, the, on, the, on the stool. Look at that. I got yelled at already. Yeah. Well, and, and the worst yet, I forgot. I, I, I went, I asked the senator and representative, is there anything specific I should say about you before I introduce you? And I was given very explicit instructions that I, I needed to mention that Tom Cullerton is good looking and has a, a engaging personality. So I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> our, our next winner is another state transformer. And, and uh, this, this demonstrates that this is a bipartisan issue and one that's interested on, or of interest uh, in both the Senate and the House because the next winner is uh, also a legislator, St State Representative Tom Demmer. He is a former Lee County board member, so he is also familiar with local government. It, and, and that's actually true of most of the legislators in Springfield, which I think is why this issue resonates with them and why they get it, is because you know, very few legislators just walk, uh, wake up one morning and become a, a legislator. They come up through the ranks of, of local government. So it, they get it, although they also have their own agenda. You know, they, they have their issue. They have. They each have their issues that are important to them. Um, but, but so Representative Demmer also, like Senator uh, Cullerton, has been in Springfield for a number of years now and has been a sponsor of and an advocate for these issues. And so, congratulations. He's also good-looking and dynamic personality. Although he didn't tell me that. But. <laughs> Well, good afternoon. I, I first, I want to say thank you to Transform Illinois. I'm glad to be associated with Transform Illinois because of the diversity of members that make up um, your, your group. As you look at the, uh, the difference that we have in the state of Illinois between if you live in the city of Chicago versus the suburbs versus a rural district or a downstate district like mine, uh, there, aren't, there aren't a lot of things that we have in common, but the challenge to, uh, to rethink and to reinvent the way that government serves its people is one that we share. And we each have a little different local flavor and local color on that, but uh, we all go about it in our own way. 
One of the things that drew me first to think about uh, ways that we could change government and transform Illinois is the fact that as a young legislator, I've watched basically every other industry that touches our lives be dramatically changed and transformed over the last uh, couple of, of decades. We see uh, the difference in the way that you um, pay your electrical bill, the way that you book a plane ticket, the way that you uh, interact with your, your kids' teachers, the way that you track all these different things had changed radically in the last 20 years. You can do everything from the palm of your hand right now. And it's not just that uh, those organizations have found a way to apply technology as a solution, it's that they've been responsive to people. It's that they've rethought the way that they relate to the people that they serve. And I think too often government's been a kind of gatekeeper in that, in that uh, area, saying, well, some ideas, uh, you know, some, some things that have been in place, some lines that were drawn 50, 60, 70, 100 years ago are what the, the hand that we were dealt and that's what we have to deal with today. But I think it's really important for us and it's a challenge for us as, as policymakers to, to rethink those and to make sure that we're living in a time where we're responsive to what the people expect of us, uh, that, we, that we offer the kind of options that people are looking for, and that we rethink um, the way that we do business. The other thing that kind of comes to mind is I, I think if, if we hear and we all heard countless times how many units of local government there exist in the state of Illinois. So the pessimist in us might say, well, gosh, this is uh, – this is this huge burden, and how do we shake off 8,000 units of local government? It's an insurmountable challenge. But the optimist might say, you know, on the federal level, there's been a discussion that states are laboratories of democracy. I think it's fair to say that in a state, that cities and counties and units of local governments should be laboratories of democracy. And with 8,000 units, we have more than enough to try out every solution that any policymaker could suggest. <laughs> That's how we take those and try to promote that spirit of competition that Professor Harris mentioned. That's how we give people a chance to, to try something that hasn't been tried before and share what works and to learn from failures and, and to, uh, to kind of bring that as a uniting factor for all of us. So again, I'm, I'm very grateful for this award and I, I also am grateful for all the work that uh, Transform Illinois does to help support Senator Cullerton and I and, and all, many of our colleagues in Springfield as we try to make policy solutions here. Thank you very much. All right, next up, we shift gears a little bit and enter into our local Transformer Award. Uh, this one is, is for a, a local community, typically, or, or sometimes an individual in a community that has done something, you know, it, it, as opposed to at a statewide level, uh, some uh, more of an example, a specific example of something wonderful. And again, in your materials, there's a description of what's been happening in the village of Agon Algonquin. Um, I actually know how to say that. I'm just not saying it very well today. Uh, and especially with their intergovernmental agreements with other local communities, a way to be more efficient and effective in delivery of services. And, and that's really an important part of this. It's not necessarily about consolidating it's about making do with what you have and, and giving this, those services uh, in, in the best way possible so uh, John Schmidt who is the village manager of the village of Algonquin and he is here to accept the transformer award for the village I really wasn't, oh, well, thank you very much. I, re I really wasn't prepared to give a speech. I was told now you're just going to accept the award. So, so uh, however, I can go for quite long, so cut me off when I. Um, when we started the effort in the village of Algonquin, uh, I was fortunate enough to be elected about 25 years ago. Uh, we didn't have any border agreements with our neighbors, and over a period our village manager at the time, Bill Gannick, uh, and we worked together to create the border agreements, and that started us on a road of cooperation, um, whether it be trying to get a highway project completed that, that it affects the entire region and getting the cooperation of all the other communities in the area and the counties, or uh, working to create a 911 service that certainly solidifies all of the costs and everything into one local uh, uh, entity. We've got about 23 um, contracts or agreements with our neighbors at this point. And certainly, we never expected to get an award like this. This is, this is beyond anything that I would certainly have expected. But, uh, and the whole thing was, when you, when you look ahead, 
that 20 years to try to figure out what's our community going to look like, and you look at the numbers, it just doesn't balance. And the goal has always been to keep our taxes at uh, the constant rate or lower them if possible. And that was not going to happen at the rate we were going with the, with the pension plans that we've got coming and with all of the costs going up and the current, we're certainly not going to get any help from the state or the federal government uh, or leadership. And I don't mean that as a slam, it's just that the politics that we have right now is just not conducive to, to being cooperative. We took on the responsibility of, of making, of, of uh, doing things uh, that were kind of out of the box, um, and it has really paid off in a lot of ways. Uh, we, we gather all of our uh, restaurants cooking oil, and we filter it, and we throw it in our diesel trucks, and things like that that are, are it doesn't save us a lot of money. But it's, it's a way to show leadership in a, in, to other, our neighbors, and they show us as well. It's, it, we're, not, we're not alone in that. So Tip O'Neill said all, all government is local. And I really think if you look at the environment in the state and you look in the environment in Washington, I genuinely think that we're the leaders. And it's organizations like this and awards like this that show that that leadership means something and that... Uh, maybe they're going to take the example from us rather than the opposite. So thank you very, very much. All right, this last one is my favorite. I mean, nothing. Oh, John, don't go. You need to. You need to join these guys up here. Actually, no. I'm gonna, oh, all village, right. <laughs> sorry. No, no, Tim no. Schlonegger. Oh, okay. Well, and sorry. All right. I just, my one job, and I did it wrong. Um, our, our very next, our, our next one is my favorite. And, and, and it's it, nothing, it, it, nothing wrong with, with the politicians and these large, bigger stories. But this one is just a perfect example. And uh, I, I, I'm thrilled to be introducing Tom Seaslack. I want to make sure I get your name right, from the Central, Century Hill Lighting District. Come on up, Tom. You, you are our citizen transformer. This is, they have, well, I'll let you tell the story because it's, I'm sure you can tell it better than I do, but it's it's just wonderful. I'm so excited to Thank give you, you this award. Thank you very much. Okay, never would I have expected to be here uh -huh. <laughs> the city of Chicago talking to all these politicians <laughs> and other administrators. Thank you very much for selecting me for an award. However, I have to say that uh, I shared this with a lot of the predecessors that have uh, worked in my community, the Century Hill subdivision in order to solve what Chris labeled as a horizontal integration of <laughs> cost and, and, and supporting services. Uh, Forty some years ago the subdivision was formed and uh, the developer went out of business and so the community got together trying to support the lighting that had been established for it. So we searched high, we searched low, Naperville, Lyle, everywhere we could think of to do that and no one would have us without taking on a huge tax burden. So we have supported the community for over 40 years. Uh, there have been about 20 people involved that have done that service as trustees, which I'd like to acknowledge as well. And about five years ago, I think Dan Cronin and the team started rolling in terms of looking at services in DuPage County, uh, doing studies through Hewitt or one of those big companies that does those studies, and made suggestions that we try again. And we did try to follow through with some of that and none of that came to pass. Then we got a, a light bulb moment when Don Cronin and his team started to put into effect through the legislature a, a, a path to be able to do this. So basically uh, we like to thank him and his staff who did a lot of hard work in terms of doing that and educating us trustees who really don't know politics at all. And uh, I think we've done a service for the community and a 40 year journey is pretty much ended. Thank you very much. Oh, don't forget your award. Oh, Tom. Yeah, he, he didn't. He didn't mention that uh, they had 77 lights. I think it was in their district. This is one of those special government units of, of, of government in our state. One of the 8,000, 
and it was created to, to take care of 77 light bulbs. And uh, it's not anymore. All right, well, congratulations to all of our, our winners. It, it really is great to have all of you here and um, to be able to celebrate your successes and, and to challenge and motivate the rest of us to try to uh, do our own transforming and uh, be able to share. In, and for those of you out there from other local governments, uh, share out, tell us your stories. We want to hear about them. Uh, and, and so we can hear from you next year, perhaps. All right, the next session is going to be obviously a Q&A with these folks, and I want to introduce Dave Bennett from the Metropolitan Mayor's Council. He is going to uh, be the moderator for the Q&A with them, and unfortunately, unlike Judy, I don't have a beautiful introduction for you. I'm just going to introduce you. Here comes Dave Bennett. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Uh, and I too would like to add my congratulations to our uh, class of 2016 Transformers uh, in, in Illinois. Uh, that's just outstanding. For those of you who don't know about the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus, uh, we are a partnership of the 275 mayors in the uh, greater Chicago region. Uh, we have been uh, involved uh, in service delivery issues since about 2007 when we created a, a service delivery task force. Uh, that actually uh, received funding from the MacArthur Foundation to do a series of pilot studies in the region uh, where we were looked at uh, consolidating uh, uh, services and, uh, you know, whole, whole departments, actually, uh, among our, our municipal members. Um, and we focused primarily on, on uh, police and, and fire and a little bit on, on code enforcement. We've also been involved uh, as a resource uh, to the governor's uh, task force on local government consolidation and unfunded mandates. Uh, we prepared a report in, in which we uh, kind of inventoried all of the shared services and consolidation efforts that municipalities uh, have been engaged in uh, you know, over the many years. And in fact, uh, we found out that the, the earliest examples of uh, shared services and consolidations uh, dated back to uh, the 1950s. Uh, but as Carol mentioned, I'm, I'm here, that's enough about the Mayor's Caucus, I'm, I'm here to uh, tee up a, a conversation uh, with our uh, award winners. Um, and I think I'd like to uh, start uh, with Mr. Cieslik, uh from the uh, Century Hill uh, Lighting District. Uh, actually, I know a little bit about this because the lady who used to cut my hair lives in Century Hill and we used to have conversations as she was, you know, trimming away. But um, when, when the decision was made a few years ago uh, to uh, you know, kind of dissolve uh, the district and, and work in partnership with uh, DuPage County, uh, what was that process like in terms of the residents of the subdivision and getting them on board to agree to you know, pursue that? Well, we're, uh, we're unincorporated, basically. That's mm -hmm. you know, one, one item. We have a homeowner association that has, you know, cannot except get volunteer dues and things like that. So we basically worked with this volunteer um, organization, uh, pulled several meetings together, discussed possibilities that were paid before us with the community, assured the community that it, at the first planche of it, that costs would not go up and service would not go down. And those were the two very large items we had to discuss. Uh, and that it was beginning to be troublesome to get volunteer trustees to take on responsibilities like this. And that a series of two or three meetings, public meetings, and we went through financials, we went through all these sorts of things. A, a mailed survey went out. We got very good response from it. There was 300 homes involved. We got about 180 back, and there were only three votes against. We went door to door to make sure we would meet a threshold of 60% active positive participation mm -hmm. oh that's terrific it sounds like you you did your homework and and made the case uh for the this, the dissolution of the district and yeah. i think that's a, a key that's what we've seen in our work is that you really need to communicate with with the public to let them know what what the the pros and the cons are of, of your efforts and as an aside one of the three no's was the failure of another not, not your organization <laughs> to, to deliver <laughs> service oh okay <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Tim uh, Schlaniger from uh, Algonquin. Uh, congratulations on uh, Algonquin and Mayor uh, Schmidt, President S uh, Schmidt, uh, for uh, this award today. Um, now, the description in the packets that I think everyone has received uh, indicates that you 
uh, that the village started out uh, sharing building inspection services with, uh, with one community, and then uh, that kind of grew over time. You expanded your efforts to include uh, several other services like uh, fleet maintenance and uh, GIS and information technology, snow plowing, school safety, and some other things. Can you share with us what the keys were to the successful expansion of your efforts, especially in, in just five short years? Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to, again, thank Transform Illinois for this event, Metropolitan uh, Planning Council, Chairman Dan Cronin being a great example in the region, and my team here, uh, President John Schmidt, uh, who's given that vision and leadership, uh, Bill Gannick, the former manager who helped set it up, uh, Todd Walker, our human resources director, you have to hire well and train constantly to have good staff. We have Craig Arps here, our building commissioner, a master code professional with an outstanding staff that makes it attractive for other towns to to want to partner with us then assistant manager Mike Canberra who's worked with all our finances and I think one of the keys is it is about culture it's about investing in your staff constantly and this is going to sound cliche but if you're awesome you can do awesome things and people are going to want to partner with you so one of the things we constantly do is try to invest in our employees and make them more valuable. And we actually partner with organized labor in our union and sit down with them and try to get the higher skilled people doing higher skilled labor. And we're constantly using the 80-20 rule. We try to divest ourselves from the 80% of the things that create 20% of the value and really invest in the 20% of what we do that creates the other, you know, the real 80% of the value. And we're constantly trying to lean up and change what we do. And John Schmidt talked about how we started out with border agreements with our neighbors. And in today's society, we do too much through electronic communications. We're all too busy and we don't break enough bread. We don't have enough cups of coffee. So one of the things that you know, we focus on, for example, is me as village manager, I've tried to sit down and have a cup of coffee one-on-one -on -one for about an hour with every single employee in our town. We sit down and talk to our neighbors like that. And when you can start talking about the challenges we have in government, the vision, how we need to change, there's some kind of understanding uh, and partnerships that can be created. And I think that's been the real key for these shared services because our employees know that it's scary when you talk about how we are going to reduce staff, how we're going to change what they do. But if there's a trust that's built up over time through good communication, when we make those changes and say, you know what, we're actually going to outsource this activity, but we're going to move you over here, we're going to reorganize the department, uh, things will be okay. And that's been the key is more than anything that long-term culture and those relationships and sitting down and actually getting to know people. Great, great. Two common themes, communication between the, the district and, and the uh, village of Algonquin and its surrounding neighborhood, neighbor, neighbors. Um, I'd like to switch to our, our two state legislators now. Uh, I think, as it was pointed out earlier, you know, there seems to be a bit of a sea change in Springfield when it comes to uh, consolidation and, and shared, shared services. I think you both articulated that uh, to a certain extent in, in your remarks. Um, you know, is there, I, I, this, this question is kind of two-part. Um, is there something in particular, some particular reason why that's, that's occurring? Uh, that, that you could, uh, you know, fill us in on. Uh, and then the other thing is, is what, what more can we be doing as Transform Illinois to uh, help you uh, as, as the leaders, uh, it really, in this effort? When Mary Sue pointed out that there have been 22 bills pa uh, introduced and five passed this year, that, that's pretty darn significant. Um, what can we be doing to, to see more of that uh, in the future? Let's start with uh, Representative Demmer. Thanks, and I think this is a great question because uh, I don't think that Senator Cullerton and I could stress enough how important it is that groups like Transform Illinois are willing to communicate to your members, fill out witness slips when bills come up, make phone calls to your elected officials. There are a lot of folks, when we're trying to make a change to the way that business happens in, in government, there are a lot of folks who defend the status quo, a lot of people who benefit from how things are done today, they're very familiar with it, very comfortable with it. 
And they're, they're, they're right there to uh, oppose or cast a lot of doubt or skepticism on proposals uh, for change. It's incredibly important to have people like uh, Transform Illinois and each of the, the constituencies that you represent, each of the areas of the state that you represent, it's incredibly important to have you uh, as a part of the, the, the push to make those kind of changes. I think one of the important things that we have to do is make sure that people don't, uh, we, we alleviate some of the fear that I think has been talked about a couple times about how will this change the services that I receive? Are, are my costs going to go up? Am I going to you know, know who I should talk to about certain problems? And I think it's really important that we, uh, we don't play um, the proposal off against some uh, hypothetical perfect scenario. What we're really looking for is an incremental improvement on what we have today. We know what the alternative is. It's to do nothing. It's to continue having the same kind of situation that we have. So when we make a proposal for reform, it doesn't have to change everything in one fell swoop. It doesn't have to make a change that, that happens at the stroke of midnight or with a flip of a switch. It just has to be a little bit better than what we have in place today. And so I think your, your organizations advocating for kind of the, the continued work that we have or step after step that we can take through some smaller bills that maybe aren't quite as scary to people or don't, uh, don't get you know, many people to, to put their defenses up. If we make some progress through those, it'll just continue the kind of momentum we have today. How about Senator Mayor Cullerton? You're, you're always a mayor to me, Senator. I <laughs> I, being down in Springfield, sometimes it's better to be the mayor. Um, <laughs> I, I will have to say, probably uh, some of the best way that this got accomplished um, was the bill that, that I passed with the help of a lot of my colleagues uh, back in 2013 had been tried for probably 10 years prior. Somebody had always brought up consolidating. 7,000 units of local government isn't new. Like, this didn't happen last week and we just started addressing it. This has been a number that's been out there for a long time and people tried to get it done. Uh, and I think sort of the, the willingness of DuPage County to be the test case. Uh, and once they were the test case and, and showed great results like Tom had over in Century Street, that's just, that was a result that actually fostered people to go, wait a second, it can work it's accomplished, it's done well, it didn't cause chaos and, and cause nobody to have any lights and the, and the pyramids didn't come down or anything else. Uh, and I think you saw a big push for that as well. Once you had an example that showed it wasn't as scary as people thought, it wasn't going to turn Illinois crazy and get everything out of control, and that you could still deliver those services at a cost to the taxpayer, and they would still have their lights. Um, but somebody had to be first. And I mean, it worked out very well for us that we had a great partnership team on the initial Senate bill. It was an entire bipartisan effort. And it was leadership from both the Republican and the Democrat side that got that pushed through. Um, so I think that was really sort of the starting point. And truthfully, all of this is done. All of this needs to be done with data to back it up. If you have the data to show when you do this, this will be the underlying result. You'd be amazed at how hard it is for people to say no if you have the actual data to back everything up and show the cost savings and the fact you're not hurting taxpayers. And that if you take from one, it's not going to make another pay more but that it's just going to do better for all of us, I think you'll see uh, continued movement forward on it. Uh, like we said, the goal is, is to do what we did in DuPage County and make it statewide. Allow every county that opportunity. And if we have to have it so that each legislator has to run it for whatever counties they're in charge of, then we'll go that way. But either way, it can go throughout the entire state. I'm told that we have time for two questions from our audience. Who would like to be the first? Who would like to be second? Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, no takers? Oh, here we do. We've got a young lady there, please. One, the way I understand it, one of the reasons there are so many taxing bodies is because there are limits on the tax, the amount of taxes that a body can 
raise in any given year. Uh, so as a result, this unit wanted the ability to tax more because they needed more money, and then this one, and then this one, and that's how it proliferated. So how do you convince those people um, to <laughs> uh, give up some of their taxing ability? Who would like to field that question? <laughs> Anyone? Senator? I could, I could start, but a, you know, a village manager may actually have had, had those discussions, <laughs> actually may have had those discussions with people, because my village manager had them as well. But I, I think you'll, that's a very valid point that people fear, and some of the units came off of because they couldn't get the revenue that they were supposed to get before. Uh, again, going back to having the data of showing what the actual revenue stream will be and how it won't lose the service is a very big piece of the full consolidation. If the people of, of the lighting district didn't think they were gonna still get lights, whatever was coming out of their bill for lights, they would not want it to go away. But they know they're still going to get lights. That is part of the deal now with the consolidation. So as long as you could show how that money is going, where the service is going to continue, you will have not only buy-in from everybody else, but buy-in from the public as well. I just add to that, I think I, uh, Professor Barry had a great slide about the Silk Road, about the, the Rhine. I mean, that, that's what we have to think about here, is that every individual uh, taxing body is right now kind of doing the math of how will this proposal change what I'm going to collect. And we're, we're lacking that cohesive look at what's it cost start to finish. And so instead of thinking about it from the perspective of an individual taxing body, we've got to look at this from the, from the taxpayer's perspective. Understand when somebody makes a purchase of a home in a certain area, they have to pay the entire tax bill and, and they're not you know, paying special attention to whether one area has gone up 3% or one's gone down 3%. They're paying, they're paying that rate. So I think it's important to, to remember that uh, the government is organized to provide services to the people. Uh, we can organize it in many different ways. The way that we're doing today has kind of led to this phenomenon of everybody looking out for their own little area, ignoring how that affects the, the big picture. Um, and so I think that a lot of these efforts have to be about taking this back and, and looking at the stacking up of all the taxes that apply to, to an individual's home uh, and, and looking at these things at a little bit bigger picture. I actually have, I actually know the answer to this. No, but like there. <laughs> no, but there's a saying. You know, the hardest animal to kill in the state of Illinois is a school mascot. Mm -hmm. uh, consolidation is hard. One of the things I sit around tables with village managers, and we almost always come back to we're only seven percent of the tax bills. It's really the schools that need to get their house in order. And if they would just take care of themselves and the townships would take care of themselves, then this whole issue would be go, go away. We're already doing everything we need to at the local level. And I think that's a bunch of bull. We might be 7 or 8% of the tax bill, but all we can do is control what we can control. And there's things we can do across governments. And there's things we're going to be forced to do. And I think this competition, this stress we're always are under now, is only going to be much greater in the future. And Algonquin is a AAA bond rated community with a great tax base, phenomenal homes, good businesses. And every night I'm laying in bed thinking about the crisis we're going to have five years now from in the future. There's a lot of dead man walking, dead governments walking right now, and they don't even know it. They're in la la land. I look, there's one thing about. Uh, we look at the constraints and the pensions and everything else. I also look at how the economy is changing. The tax revenue streams that exist today, it's not just property taxes, are going to disappear. Uh, the way retail is delivered is going to change overnight. And I, I wrote down a couple of notes here. I, I use the example of, you know, Kodak invented digital photography or the digital camera back in 1973. All their executives said that's not going to be the next thing. They totally watched that go by. They went bankrupt in 2012, right? Mm -hmm. There are changes happening that we got to get in front of, that we got to start changing now from a local government. Ford, I love their CEO. 
He says, we're not a car company anymore, we're a mobility company. They just acquired, uh, uh, what's it called here? One more. Chariot, it's a, it's a Silicon Valley Bay and Area shuttle service and bike program. They're looking at mobility. Ford knows that the auto industry is changing. Airbnb, think about this. Think about every hotel with all their property across the world. Uh, look at Holiday Inn, you name it. Airbnb, an app created on a phone, is worth more than the most valued hotel chain in the world. They recently raised $850 million at a valuation of $30 billion. So government, we have to understand the economy is changing, the constraints are changing, our revenue is going to change. We are getting disrupted whether we like it or not. We got to control what we want to, whether we can or not. And can I fix and eliminate all these other local governments? No. I got to take care of my little piece of the pie and hope other people come along for the ride, and that's all we can do. Very insightful. One, one more question we have time for. Susan, and that's a great segue into our concluding remarks. That would be great. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> Okay, so thank you. So my question is, um, Dan and I served in Springfield and we sometimes thought we were down there to prevent bad things from happening. Um, and as taxpayer dollars are scarce, the funding has been depleted in so many different arenas. Is there a possibility that there could be new local units of government introduced? Is Could that happen? Because everybody's looking for a way to get extra money. I was looking at that castle on the Rhine and they need it for tolls, but somebody else could need it someplace else to get extra revenue. So is that a possibility? Say no, please. We are on camera, correct? No, that can never happen. Um, <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> there is actually a moratorium in place um, and, and hopefully, uh, you know, I'm just in my first term, uh, but as somebody once said, don't ever think something can't happen in Springfield, because it can. And I'm sure you probably know that, as well as Chairman Cronin knows that, uh, and anybody who's down in Springfield knows that something could. Uh, I am hopeful it won't. I'm hopeful the moratorium in place will make it so nothing does. But again, it is Springfield. Okay, well, thank you. That, that's all the time we have uh, for, for questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Representative Demmer? No, would you? no, no okay. Yeah, okay. Got it. Well, th thank you all very much for this discussion. Really appreciate it. And, and again, congratulations to our class of uh, 2016. At this point, I'd like to call up um, former state senator Susan Garrett, who is currently the chair of the Illinois Campaign for uh, Political Reform. Uh, the ICPR is a nonpartisan public interest group that conducts research and advocates reform to promote public participation in government, to address the role of money in politics, and to encourage integrity, accountability, and transparency in government. Senator? Thank you. Dan and I just couldn't get enough of it in Springfield. So thank you, everyone um, who participated today, um, including our award winners, and Dan Cronin, the chairman, uh, chairman of DuPage County, um, and especially uh, members of the audience who are here who understand and support the need to uh, find ways in which to reduce the um, several thousand units of local government. Um, I also um, want to make sure that we thank uh, Metropolitan Planning Council for hosting this event today, Mary Sue Barrett. Okay. Um, as you know, local government um, matters, and it matters big time. And it's the area that we as taxpayers and leaders can have a direct impact upon. We can all help to transform the functions of local government by reducing the number of redundant and expensive layers of government and improve efficiency and effectiveness. We should all know the fact. We heard it today. I thought it was 7,000 local units of government. I found out today it's 8,000. Um, it, that's a very high price for taxpayers, a very high price that, quite frankly, we can't afford. 
And in many, if not in most cases, we cannot even justify the existence of many of these government entities. With the leadership of Transform Illinois over the last two years, we have built a bipartisan coalition that has made two significant inroads. Number one, working together, we have begun to change the mindset of local leaders and the culture of traditional government spending from silos to a more collaborative, innovative approach in order to deliver government services more efficiently. Number two, we have struck a chord with the majority of taxpayers and le legislators. This was made perfectly clear uh, during the last legislative session in Springfield when lawmakers introduced over 22 bills on government consolidation and 15 legislators attended our news conference in Springfield last April to support the efforts of Transform Illinois. How can you help? Share our vision. Invite Chairman Cronin, Professor Barry, and other members of Transform Illinois to discuss the goals and to speak in your community, to speak to your mayors, to speak to your city council members, or at a community forum. We have a simple, very clear message that cuts across party lines, geographical borders, and entrenched ideologies. Together, we can find ways local governments can form more partnerships by sharing services to reduce cost and duplication of resources. Pretty simple. So please, keep the dialogue going with your neighbor, your mayors, your state reps, your state senators, and make sure that Transform Illinois is something that we all look at in the future and see continued progress. Thank you for your support and belief that we together can transform Illinois.